shall never end. Ten, and on the, we'll sing all the verses. And the ushers come up on the last verse, please. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day! Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. and it's going to be rough. Sammy said, you sure we can sing that song? I said, yeah. <clears throat> I hope I can sing that song. <laughs> oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, 
how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountains grander, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think, that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou Thank you, Brother Allen. What a blessing you are. Appreciate you, Brother. Let's, let's pray. Father, we come before you this hour, and we pray, Father, that you would take this time, set it apart for your glory. I pray, Father, you'd hide me behind the cross. Pray that your word would be anointed in such a way that it would accomplish all that you desire. Father, we love you, not as we ought, but because you first loved us and gave your life as a ransom for us. Father, I pray that you would make yourself known and felt and experienced this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning, uh, it's good to see you, and I... Uh, have a message, if you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. As you do, there's a story about a man by the name of Horatio. Sounds like a real tough name, doesn't it, Horatio? I wouldn't want to get in a, in a fight with a man by the name Horatio or make him mad at me. But a man named Horatio G. Spafford was his name. He was a successful lawyer and a businessman in Chicago. He had a wonderful family, wife Anna, five children. 
they were not strangers to tears and tragedy. Their young son died of pneumonia in 1871. And in that same year, much of their business was lost in the great Chicago fire. If you've ever, ever read history books, you will know what I'm talking about, about the Chicago fire. Yet God, in his mercy and kindness, allowed the business to flourish once more. He was a, not only a successful businessman and lawyer, but he also was a Christian. He would travel and he would uh, participate in crusades with the renowned Dwight, uh, Dwight T. Eisenhower, uh, Dwight L. Moody. I don't know why I got him presidents, I guess, after July 4th. I don't know. That's where my mind went. Uh, Dwight L. Moody, if you've ever read anything about Dwight L. Moody, what a wonderful, godly man. And he was planning to go uh, uh, to, to go to England and uh, go over, over the seas and, and travel with him. Uh, but because of his successful business and because uh, of uh, things he had to do, he put his family uh, on the Villa de Harve ahead of him, and he had planned to meet them on the other side. About four days into the crossing, him being in Chicago, his family being on the uh, Villa de Harve, the Villa de Harve collided with a powerful iron hulled Scottish ship, the Loch Arn. Suddenly, all those on in board were in grave danger. Anna hurriedly brought her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret Lee, Bessie, and Tanetta and prayed that God would spare them if that could be his will or to make them willing to endure whatever awaited them. Within approximately 12 minutes, the Villa de Harve slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying with it 226 of its passengers, including the four Spafford children. A sailor rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating on a piece of the wreckage, and it was Anna. Still alive. He pulled her into the boat, and they were picked up. It reminds me of that hymn called The Lifeboat, if you ever remember that old hymn. He picked her up in this lifeboat by another large vessel, which nine days later landed them in Kadarf Wells. From there, she wired her husband with a message which began saved alone. Mr. Spafford later framed and telegram the telegram and placed it in his office. Another of the ship's survivors, Pastor Wise, later recalled Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. And now they've been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford booked passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him they were over the place where his children went down. And according to Bertha Spafford Vester, a daughter born after the tragedy, Spafford wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows row, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. If you're like me, a kid growing up in Oklahoma, you think catfish is seafood. And you think the sea is a, is a lake. You don't know the difference. Remember our first time at sea, we were on a big old ship and 17-decker and we got in a storm and, and the water came all the way almost to the top deck. S scared me to death. I was so thankful to get back to land. When you see those, those waves... And they roll. What depth of, of, of lyrics came from the soul of grief that painted the picture of the hymn that said, When sorrows like sea billows they roll. Whatever is my lot, thou, who's thou? Jesus 
taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Sometimes the Lord Jesus allows us to go through the lot of life. It is the only way, the only place, and the only personal guide that teaches us it as well. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus comes on the scene and he is coming on the side of a beautiful hillside. And he sets it down with crowds. And in, the, in verses 1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he, being Jesus, went up the mountain, went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, and I want you to go to verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This morning I want to share with you some thoughts. And you're like, uh-oh. Where are you going, Pastor? I promise you we won't go anywhere the Lord doesn't want to take you. But if you will trust the Lord, the Lord will see you through. Seeing the crowds, I think that's powerful. He sees you. He sees me. I'm, a, I'm amazed when Moses on the backside of a desert is wandering and, and the Bible calls, says that he's pas, pasture, pasturing. He would later be pastoring but he's pasturing his father-in-law's sheep. And on the backside of a desert, God finds him and says this word. I see. I hear their cries and I see them. This morning you need to know God hears you and he sees you. If you hear nothing else this morning, God hears you and he sees you. This week, we, uh, I can't help but, but be navigating with people and navigating with what they're going through and navigating, and not that this is inspired by that uh, alone, but I can't help but that to frame what Jesus went through. And as you know, uh, my assistant, Debbie, her, uh, her sister-in-law died this week, and so this last week, and, and we uh, took the day off uh, the office that is and uh, a group of us went down to Walnut Ridge and uh, experienced that day with her and with the family at First Baptist Walnut Ridge not, in, not only that but just a couple of days ago Kyle Davidson's father passed away so remember him and their family as they navigate to Forest City. In addition to that, I, we get back on Wednesday from, from our uh, navigating with Miss Debbie and her family. And I had to share the word with the church family, which some of you will hear for the first time today, uh, that our chairman of deacons, uh, Ron, Brother Ron, has been diagnosed with bladder cancer. So, with that information, which is not hurt and loss and grief and pain and all those things are not strangers to any one of us, but oh, how real it is when you go through it personally, amen? So, Bible says in Matthew 5, Jesus saw the crowd. And the Bible says he went up on the mountain and he sat down and he said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Another way it says is this. God blesses those who mourn. Today I want to talk about mourning. And I want to talk about the power of mourning. And I want to talk about the beauty of mourning. I want to talk about the, bless, the blessing of mourning. You know that you are blessed when, you're mor when you mourn. That doesn't sound good, does it? Today I can stand in front of you as a pastor 
and not just read words to you, intellectually give you a message, and you say, well, what do you know, preacher? You haven't lived all but 45 years of life. What do you know about loss? I've lost a thing or two. So, I believe I can stand here today with just an inkling of a, 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 of a credibility to say, I'm a richer man for it. A deeper man because of it. And more in love with my Savior. Because through the valley of the shadows of death, he was with me. And he will be with you. The Bible promises God blesses those who mourn. Life is full of losses. We mourn our disappointments. We mourn our losses. We mourn the suffering that's in the world. And if you haven't uh, mourned the suffering in the world, it's either because you're out of touch with reality or you're out in touch of life or because you, you, the, the heart of you has waxed cold like the Bible talks about. You should, the Bible says, that, that we should mourn over sin. If you have sinned lately and you haven't mourned over your condition, you, you need to ask God why. If you've navigated with anybody and you have noticed that they, that they have committed sin or you've been a byproduct of sin because you've realized that when people sin, it, it's, it, it's not just to them. It hurts others, doesn't it? I know this is, a, this is a hard subject. This doesn't make you jump, shout hallelujah, but it will liberate you. The Via Dolorosa was not the most joyous time for Jesus Christ. But the way of suffering, I promise you, was part of the wonderful resurrection story. And the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he considered it pure joy. And he endured the cross. He despised its shame. He endured it. Why? Because he considered it joy. Because he loved you. And he loved me. He became sin who knew no sin. That, blow, that blows my mind. We should mourn over sin. We should mourn over the suffering in the world and we should mourn for the lostness of our friends and our family. We should mourn over the lostness of our, our community. Do you know that 80 plus percent of the, of the community is probably lost? There's a lot of lost folks out there. I had someone call me this week and I... It was inspiring to my faith because the person uh, said, I was reading the scripture and it just really shook my world up. And I, I said, what scripture was that? And it was in the Old Testament. And it was about the blood being on your hands if, if you didn't share the gospel. In other words, if, if, you, if you, you, the blood's on your hands. Was it my fault? If I don't share the gospel and I stand before Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, it says go. It doesn't say set. It doesn't say stay here. It doesn't say be silent. It says go. Tell them. Teach them. Baptize them. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. 3% of all Baptists share their faith. When we stand before God, God's going to hold us an account of everything we said or didn't say, did and didn't do. And there's going to be a lot of people go to hell. And do we care? Do we care? We so self-absorbed, self-wounded, self-inflicted, inward focused, that we can't care and look out and be outward focused. I shared last week and, and uh, y'all came back. Praise God for you. Uh, 
I shared about our survey and I shared about its inward focus. It's inward, our, it's all about me, myself, and I. And if we we'll go there, if we're not careful. And, and I gave that report that wasn't so great. You navigate with Brother Ron today. I, he's not going to say, oh, hallelujah, I got, I got a terrible report. But you need, to, you, you need to know this today. God in you has a final word. God can't do anything you won't let him do. And God has the final word. If we just let go and let God, God can do more. With, with, God can do everything. The Bible says with God, all things are possible. The disciples look to Jesus and says, then how can anybody be saved? They saw the impossibility. If you have never got to the impossibility of, I can't get there, then something's wrong. It's like going across the Grand Canyon. You don't have any way to get across. How do I get across? Heaven's on the other side. How do I jump? I can't get there. You're right. So what do you do? Jesus is the bridge. He is the only way to get from here to there. He crossed that great divide. And God cares about you. And, the, and Jesus said, he, he, comes, he comes on the scene and he, and he says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And it sounds pretty in poetry, but he's trying to give principles. And I'm not going to unearth all of them for you today, but the reality is you're blessed when you mourn. It's powerful. It is transforming. There are five things I want you to see today, and it's this. God uses grief to draw us close to himself, number one. God uses grief to draw us close to himself. Psalms 34 and 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. If you're crushed today or brokenhearted or, or, or your spirit is, is worn out, you need to know the Lord is near. <laughs> he is near. And it's not, it, it, it's not up to you just to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and to fake it and to lie through your teeth. How you doing? Oh, I'm just fine. Y'all have done that? I've done that. And you're lying. I'm lying. But to face it. Grief is essential to my health, to your health, to our health. I want you to hear this, and I want you to write this down. There is no growth without change. There is no growth without change. There is no change without loss. There is no loss without pain. And there is no pain without grieving. There's, so back to it. There's no growth without change. There's no change without loss. There's no loss without pain. And there's no pain without grieving. Here's some unhealthy reactions to our losses. A couple of ways. First of all, repression. Repression simply means trying to unconsciously block a painful thought out of our minds. We do that unconsciously. Just as much as we unconsciously sin. We unconsciously react. So we, un we unconsciously stuff. Or we block. The other is suppression. Consciously trying to, consciously trying to block a painful thought. Not going there, not going there, not going there. You can read all the self-help books in the world and go through all the stages over and over and over and over like a roller coaster ride. But there are, really, there are really two real healthy ways to navigate it. Here it is. Oh, wait a minute. I learned it this way. That's okay. Don't ignore that. Just, just, just tr trust me with this one. First of all, express it to friends. Number two, confess it to the Lord. Number one, express it to your friends. Number two, confess it to the Lord. 
when you realize this principle, and I want you to pay attention to this principle because you and I are living out this principle in various ways. If I do not let it out in in healthy ways, I will act it out in unhealthy ways. If we do not grieve over the losses of our life, we get stuck at the stage of where we're at. If we do not go through grief, we get stuck at whatever stage we're at. Thus, we spend the rest of our lives reacting to something that happened a long time ago and taking it out on everyone else around us. Whoa, that hurt, didn't it? Some of us are stuck at about eight or nine years old. And you keep playing that tape recorder over and over and over because of whatever was done to you. He done me wrong songs. Psychologists want to tell you you're a product of your own environment. That's an observation, but that should not be a destination. Remember that. Christ died for a reason. (laughs) He didn't waste his price. You're not a waste. Jesus didn't come all this way to shed his own blood and to take all your sin for you to stay there. He did not waste it. And we get stuck there. And if we don't wake up to the, the, revel, the revelation of the truth and process the pain and pro- process the purpose and walk with the person, we will miss it all. And we will stay bitter and angry and unforgiving and, hurt, and hurtful at God and the very one. We'll be the pouting prophet like Jonah. We'll run from God and go the opposite directions. We will refuse to be comforted like like Sister Rachel in the Bible. We will stay stuck. So God designed mourning. He designed pain just as much as he designed joy. Pain is an emotion. Grief is an emotion. And there's a purpose in it. He created you with sensory things on your hands so when you know it's hot, it's hot. And it tells your brain real quick when you touch something that's hot. Amen? One time I was growing up and and I lived on a, a farm, and there was uh, the neighbor had an uh, electric, wa- uh, electric fence, and it had just freshly rained. And I walked out barefoot. Probably my problem today. But anyway, <laughs> uh, natural shock treatment. I, I touched it and didn't even know it. And oh boy, it lit, it, you light up my life. There's a 70s song, something like that. And it just lit my light up, my world up. Woo! I came, I came alive. It, it got my attention real quick. It hurt. It hurt. Uh, There have been times I've experienced other hurt in life. When I was all of five years old, I was uh, in my backyard and we had the high, the high wood fences and, and I was playing and jumping around like all boys do. And I jumped off that fence and we had had some railroad ties that were at the, on the ground. I wasn't paying attention, but there was a railroad spike sticking up. And I jumped right on that railroad spike. I don't remember every detail of the moment. I just remember my father having to take that out of my foot that was halfway through my feet. 
Later he would tell me how painful it was for him to have to even do that. I'm so thankful that he didn't run away from the pain. I'm so thankful my Jesus didn't jump off that cross and call down the angels to rescue him. I'm so thankful that he chose to forgive you and me on that cross. I'm so thankful that he as a priest considered others instead of himself. I'm so thankful that he was reaching out to that thief that deserved no forgiveness and no pardon and no evangelistic gospel message, but he did. And today, he's in paradise with Christ. So mourning is very healthy. For Psalms 32 and 3, for when I kept silent, back up mourning is healthy in Psalms 39 and 2 it says I keep quiet not saying a word my suffering only grew worse the other negative side instead of mourning and I want you to pick up on this is this moaning moaning do you know the difference there is a huge difference Moaning is another form of complaining and grumbling and murmuring. David said in Psalms 32 and 3, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For a day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But when he mourned, there was a story in the Bible about Hezekiah and he was, uh, God uh, sent a word to him and said, get your house in order, you're going to die. And he turned over in his bed, he was real sick and he turned over in his bed and he, and he cried out to God and he said, God, and I want to quote this in the King James because that's how I memorized it. It's this, this way. My eyes failed with looking up or upward. I was oppressed. Like a crane or swallow, so did I chatter. But I mourned as a dove. And he cried out, undertake for me. Now I don't know about you, but there are birds that just go on and on and on and on. They chatter. But there is something deep and soulful about a dove. And he said, like a dove, I mourned. And my eyes failed. He cried out to God and he said, undertake for me. And God did. And he gave him 15 more years. God designed our grieving and mourning to draw him closer to us, number one. Number two, God grieves with us. Number one, God, God, God uses grief to draw us close to himself. Number two, God grieves with us. Isaiah 61, 2 and 3 says, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. It's kind of like the, 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 blind, the blind man uh, that the disciples saw begging the, and said, Master is uh, Messiah, Jesus, is he blind because of his sin or is he blind because of his parents' sin? And Jesus said, neither. It's to bring glory to the Father. You mean your pain can bring glory to God? Yes. That probably makes you even angrier, doesn't it? Church ought to be a place to be honest. Church ought to be a place that you, have to, you can take all the mask off. Church ought to be a place where you can, can, un, can, can literally become 
exposed to God because he sees everything anyway. And church ought to be a safe place where we can experience healing and wholeness and restoration. And I think one day when we get to heaven, if we're not careful, we're going to realize that we were part of the, 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 the contributing factor that we made church not a safe place. We made church not a healthy place. We made church not a healing and a whole place. Why? Because we had to come up with a suit and a tie and all perfect. And how are you doing? Oh, I'm just fine. I'm lying through my teeth. Because our world's falling apart. We're dying and we don't even want to admit it. That's not just personally, that's corporately. Jesus says, if you camp out in my word and abide in my word and you do what it says, you'll be my disciple. You'll know the truth and you'll be set free by it. You can't know the truth and be liberated by the truth if you don't camp out with God and abide in its truth and let the truth abide in you and live in you. He said, if I abide in you, you abide in me. There's life there, isn't there? Why, is churches, why are churches dying on the vine? Because God is allowing us to experience the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. If you want love, you sow it. If you, if you, if you, if you want gossip back, gossip. If you want slander back at you, slander. You will reap what you sow. And a lot of churches end up dying and dead. There's no life there. The Spirit of the Lord's not there. It's because it's not about Him. It's not for Him. It's not to Him. It's not through Him. It's not from Him. Lord, help us if church has become that. My prayer is that this place becomes a place where people can come and be honest. And say, I hurt. Does anybody care? Will anybody pick up a phone and call me? Somebody other than the preacher, because we expect him to do that, because we pay him to do that. And when I, when I fail you, then you size me up and I'm a failure, and then you move on to the next church. You'll keep doing that, I promise. You'll move from one church to one church to one church. You'll keep doing the, 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 the musical chair thing. Our society is full of that. Our church life's full of that. Our relationships are full of that. Our marriages are full of that. Now before, before you f feel beat up, please don't. It's this. You live in a broken world. You live in a fallen world. You live in a sinful world. But Jesus died for you. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay stuck there. You may be in your 15th church. You may be in your third marriage. You may have experienced this loss after that loss. after. Don't be defined by your disorder. Don't be defined by your disease. Don't be defined by what was said about you. Don't be defined by, by the past. Pick up this word of God and find out what God has to say about you. I promise you, if you pick this word up and you go to it and you read it and you pray to him, you will hear from him. If you haven't heard from him in a long time, I promise you, it's because you haven't picked this up and read it heartfully, spiritually, with all your heart. God is real. He's there if you just cry out to him. God is with you. God's with us. When Lazarus died, the Bible, the Bible says Jesus came and, and uh, the sisters are all singing the same song. If you'd have been here, he'd, he'd not died, Lord. But the Bible says, and this is the shortest Bible verse in the, in the, in the whole Bible. You can memorize it right here. And here it is. Jesus wept. First scripture ever memorized. Jesus wept. He wept. He cried. 
He weeps. He grieves. The Bible says he looked all over mankind. He saw the continual evilness. The hearts were continually evil. The Bible says that he grieved that he made man. The Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So number one, God uses grief to draw us to himself. Number two, God grieves with us. You don't grieve alone. And number three, God gives us community to grieve. Healing comes in community. You can call that church. You can call that family. Faith community. You were not meant to walk alone, journey alone, and carry it alone. Christianity is a community sport. You were meant for community. Romans 12, 5, 10, and 15 says this. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, and rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. When you've got a sister that's lost someone, weep with them. When you, you've lost someone in your life, it, better, it helps you to better understand the other person. You are either in two places today. You're either in pain and need of comfort or you are, need, you are not in pain and you need to give comfort. Either way, you're either in pain and need comfort or you're in pain and you need to give comfort. So my challenge to you is to, first of all, care. Care. And be aware. Be aware of what's around you. Who's walking around you. And, and be there. Job's friends were good friends for the first three days. They were there. Then they opened their mouth and spoiled it all. But they were there. At least they were there. A couple of suggestions. Practical advice. Never try to minimize others' pain. And never try to fix it. Just know that you are part of the journey and you're part of the process too. We all take steps. God's plan for each and every one of us is healing. And healing sometimes doesn't come cookie cutter and formula style be patient in affliction number one God gives, gr gives grief to draw us close to himself number two God grieves with us number three God gives us community number four God uses grief to help us grow we rarely change when we see the light we change when we feel the heat C.S. Lewis I love him he says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse the deaf world. He, I would venture to say in, in, in various people's lives right now, you would be honest to say, he's got my attention. <laughs> he's got my attention. It's a good place to be. I want to share another story with you about loss, and uh, it's about a music composer. There was a man by the name of Ludwig van, Be van Beethoven, one of my favorite composers, by the way, of classical music. He was scared to death of losing his hearing, which he eventually did, but he would have an anxiety to such a degree before it ever happens. In other words, he pre-grieved before he ever grieved, so... The process was double. He was, uh, he tried everything he could, but it just came. And he lost his hearing. Instead of giving up, he continued to write. And matter of fact, he found out that his, 
that his mind and his heart and his soul flooded with music after he became deaf. History says that he would take his piano and he would chop the legs off where he'd be flat on the ground. And he would try to put his ear to the floor to hear vibrations in order to write music. It was told that a, that a neighbor would hear, at the t hear sounds from his neighbor and he said, it's that crazy Ludwig shouting at the top of his lungs. Da, 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 da. You and I know it as the Ninth Symphony. A lyricist came around later on and he would say, Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. God of wonders, God of light. So out of great loss came great beauty, great music. And many of you experience great healing and joy and peace and comfort through music and art and other things simply because the artist processed their pain and you were the beneficiary of healing. Pain gets our attention. And he brings good out of bad. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You've got that memorized probably. For those who are called according to his purpose. The, the voice illustration says it this, uh, translation says it this way, that he orchestrates everything. Solomon says, there is a, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And he goes on and, and gives a litany of lists of there's a time for this and a time for that. And then he, and he talks about a time for mourn, to mourn. But, but don't miss this out of Ecclesiastes 3. You read Ecclesiastes and you, you think, oh man, what a depressing passage of scripture. Because everything's meaningless, you know, under the sun. That's the point. Everything under the sun is meaningless. That's where his eyesight was. But when he got his eyesight back on the creator, here's what Solomon found out. Verses 11 of Ecclesiastes 3. He has made everything beautiful in his time. As he's put eternity in our hearts. So number one, God uses grief to draw us close to himself. Number two, God grieves with us. Number three, God gives us community. And... Uh, Number four, God gives us the hope of heaven. You know, if he made everything beautiful in this time, I think about Joseph. And when he said God, what God meant for evil, what was meant for evil, God turned around and made for good for the saving of many. You know what's another beautiful verse out of Joseph's life? The Bible says in Genesis 41, it says that he had children and he named them. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, meaning God has made me to forget all my hardships in my father's house. And the second son, he named Ephraim, meaning God has made me fruitful in the land of my grieving. After all these years, I've had very few people ask me, but we lost twins before they were ever born, and we named them. Very few people have ever asked me what their names were and are. Noah, Nathaniel, and Caleb, Zachariah. God looked down in the wilderness and he heard our cries and he saw our pain. And this is the most important factor of why grief is so powerful and it's this. God gives us number four, the hope of heaven. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 
the Bible says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that, ha- that, may, that may not grieve as others do who have no hope. There are two ways to grieve. You can either grieve with hope or you can grieve with no hope. In Revelations 21, the Bible tells us that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And in John 14 and 3, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, that in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The hope of eternity with him is our hope. There is nothing else worth living for that's meaningful and hopeful and purposeful. And you need to know that your greatest ministry and your greatest purpose will come out of your greatest hurt and your greatest pain. I want to close with the lyrics of a song that is by a young man by the name of Mark Schultz and it says this closer to me I'm tired and I'm weak and every breath within me is longing just to be closer to you so I face the road ahead because I know there's no comparing to what's waiting at the end so let the rain start falling where it will and I will run through this valley just to climb the next hill and if they ask why I'm smiling after all I've been through It's because I'm just a day closer to you. Closer to me, I hear you whisper on the wind. You say, although my life is ending, a new one will begin. Closer to you, and I know I'm not alone because I can hear you in the distance saying you're almost home. So let the rain start falling where it will, and I will run through this valley just to climb to that hill. And if they ask why I'm dancing, though my days may be few, it's because I'm just a day closer to you closer to me you're in the laughter and the tears of the ones I leave behind me who have prayed me through the years closer to you and I know it won't be long till you're running down the pathway just to take me in your arms so let the rain start falling where it will and I will run through this valley to just to climb that hill and if they ask me why I'm singing Though my life's almost through, it's because I'm just a day closer to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, today you have never been born again and given your life to Jesus Christ. Today I want you to step out that aisle, walk down this, this aisle and give your life to him. He has been reaching out to you. You've tried life on your own and, and it's not worked. It's not produced the results you've longed for, but Jesus Christ has been calling and awakening you to give your life to him. Maybe you've tried religion all your life, punched the time clock at church every, every time you've come, but you've never surrendered. Maybe today you've carried hurts and you've carried pains, you've carried sorrows, you've carried past, you've carried histories, you've carried whatever way too long and you just need to put it on the altar and say, I'm not carrying it anymore. Today would you come? Make this altar a place where you meet Jesus. Make this altar a place of grace. Make this altar where you, where you get up and you turn around and you walk out here different because you met Jesus and Jesus met you there. As the music plays, we won't delay. Would you come? Would you come?